everyone. I hope you're having a great rest of your semester. So in this presentation, I'm going to be telling you guys a little bit about George Herbert Walker Bush, George H.W. He was the vice president of Ronald Reagan for both terms that Reagan was in office, the father of our 43rd president, George W. Bush, and most importantly, and for purposes of this presentation, he was the 41st president of the United States. So here's some background information for you guys just about his early life. He was born in on June 12th in 1924 in Massachusetts. However, when he later ran for office, he ran from Texas, not Massachusetts. He was born into a wealthy and very political family. And when he was 18 years old, he enlisted into the Navy and served in World War II. After the war, he graduated from Yale with a degree in economics. So before H.W. was even elected president, he was very involved in politics. His first successful election was in 1966 to the House of Representatives, and he ran as a Republican. He served in the House for two years. Later in 1980, he ran for president, but lost his party bid to Ronald Reagan. And as I said earlier, he ultimately served as his running mate and vice president for the two terms that Reagan was in office. And between the House and serving as vice president, he also held various other political positions, including ambassador, ambassador to the United Nations and chairman of the Republican National Committee during Watergate in 1973. So before I dive into some more specifics, I just wanted to give you guys a really general overview of his presidency. He won the 1988 election and became the first sitting vice president to be elected since 1837, which was Martin Van Buren and Andrew Jackson. So he was elected as soon as he was done serving as vice president for Reagan. He was elected to president as president to the, and the next election. He won with about 53% of the popular vote in 426 of the electoral votes. And this hasn't been passed since um, Obama got pretty close. I think he got 52% of the popular vote in his election. And in his presidency, he had some foreign success, but major economic problems in the U.S., which is likely what cost him his re-election in 1992 to Clinton. Um, later in this president, excuse me, later in this presentation, I'm going to be telling you guys about, I'm going to analyze HW through some of the theoretical frameworks that we talked about in class. But before then, I just wanted to give you some information on some big things that happened during his presidency so, you would, so these analyses would kind of make sense. As I said earlier, he was very involved in foreign affairs. One of the largest um, overseas involvements during his presidency was Operation Just Cause, which was U.S. involvement in Panama. Basically, we went in to overthrow the corrupt regime of General Manuel Norija, and we replaced him with the president-elect Guillermo Endara. Um, about 300 to 500 civilians, Pan um, Panama civilians, were killed during this raid. And back at home in the U.S., it received this involvement received about 75% approval rating, according to the Washington Post, which is pretty good. And this was the first military action the U.S. had taken that was unrelated to the Cold War in 40 years. And then the other big foreign affair that HW had, as you guys know, was the Gulf War. You guys know about this. It was the Iraqi President Saddam Hussein invaded Kuwait. Kuwait and um, he, uh, George H.W. Bush sent about 425,000 U.S. troops over and he rallied about 118,000 troops from Allied nations, and this was a huge success. So, as I said earlier, he succeeded in foreign involvement, but was not so lucky in economics back at home. He ran on the motto, read my lips, no new taxes, and then during his presidency, he was forced to raise taxes to try to eliminate the deficit, which is not good. Um, so here's a really great graph I found from the Business Insider that just gives a great look at the economics during HW's presidency, and there's a lot going on, so I'll try to break it down for you guys. Um, this timeline here, from 1989 to 1993, that's the duration of 
Bush's presidency. This green line here is the price of gas during his presidency. So as you can see, it kind of fluctuates here in the beginning. This gray area, is a, there's a slight recession in the U.S. So you can see during the recession, price of gas goes way up. Then it starts to go back down to its normal pattern after the recession. This red line is unemployment rates. So it's pretty moderate at the beginning of his presidency. And then during the recession, it jumps from 5.5% 5.5 to about 6.8%, which is a big, big jump in a short amount of time. And then even after the recession's over, it continues to grow until about June of 1992 before it starts to go down. This orange line here is consumer confidence according to the University of Michigan. So when Bush is elected, it's pretty high. It's pretty good until the recession when it drops and it never quite makes it back up there. And then if you guys look on the graph, this is about the time when he was going to be reelected at the time of the reelection. Um, so you can see that all his numbers are pretty bad at that point. The only number, the only line on this graph that's actually semi-decent is this blue line, and that's the S&P 500 stock price index. So it's actually pretty moderate throughout his whole presidency. There's a slight dip during the recession, but other than that, it continues to go up. So that's pretty good, but it was definitely not enough to secure him re-election. So as promised, here are some a little bit of analysis through some of the theoretical frameworks that we talked about in class. I'm going to focus on Skronik's theory of political time because HW just falls so perfectly into the articulation category. And then I'm also going to touch on Hamilton's theory a little bit, specifically his thoughts from the, from the Federalist Papers about power in the executive branch. So you guys have seen this graph before. Actually, in our book, it's a little different. I think they've flipped, affiliated, and opposed in this chart, but it still says the same thing. The re reconstruction president, articulation presidents, preemption, and disjunction. And as I said, and I'm sure as you guys have seen, HW is a perfect example of an articulation president, and he's actually specifically addressed in Skronik's book as an orthodox innovator, which is, which is somebody who directly follows a reconstruction pre president, in this case Reagan, and they kind of inherit their way of doing things, but have to find a way to practically apply those methods to their presidency. And Skronik says of an articulation president, one is well represented by George H.W. Bush, a president who came to power affiliated with a set of governing commitments that he affirmed forthrightly as providing a clear and compelling guide to future action. So some advantages of being an articulation president is that they're following the successful um, the successful era of a reconstruction president. So in this case, it was obviously Reagan. And Reagan had so fueled the Republican Party. And so going into it, Bush had a lot of um, help from that. That's likely what got him that large majority in the election. But the disadvantage is obviously he had to create a workable system from the guidelines that Reagan had kind of set. And as Skronik talked about in his book, as we talked about in class, uh, an, art, an articulation president is likely to have more overseas interference because that's where they can kind of make their own way apart from the Reconstruction era, but they all often have difficulties in the U.S. economy. And actually what's really interesting that I found in Skronik's book and that we read in that we read for a class, I think it's in chapter three. He says that of the 24 affiliated presidents before Bush, and including Bush, only four of them were re-elected to a second term. So overall, articulation presidents have some advantages going into the presidency, but they also have a lot of disadvantages. Lastly, I just want to touch on Hamilton for just a little bit. We've read a lot about Hamilton. Here's just a little quote from Federalist 70, energy in the executive is a leading character in the definition of good government. It is essential to the protection of the community against foreign attacks. It is not less essential to the steady administration of laws. 
So Hamilton, as we've talked about so many times, he was really for power in the executive and energy in the executive. He wants the, you know, he wants the executive to have more power and more ability to do things. He wants them to be able to choose the decisions that they make. And in 73 and 74, he talks more about their right to veto and their right as commander in chief. So specifically for HW, he was given the option to raise taxes or not. And while the Republicans and the vast majority of the public really didn't like the idea of raising taxes, especially after he ran on the fact that he wouldn't, um, HW thought that was what was best for the nation, so he had the right to make that decision. So in conclusion, here's a quote from HW for you guys to take with you. We must act on what we know. I take as my guide the hope of a saint, in crucial things unity, in important things diversity, in all things generosity. So I hope from this presentation you guys were able to learn a little bit more about HW and good luck on the rest of your semester.